Now for global business updates, Rotus Oduri joins us. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Dr. Abati. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Good morning, Vimbai. Good morning, Rufai. Good, Good morning to all our morning. viewers. We have so much to get into, so let me rush. Let me, let me rush through it. All right, kicking off. Uh, oil is down again. Nothing much to say there. Fear of oversupply, fear of lower demand. Non-OPEC plus companies, excuse me, countries are producing more oil. You can see the numbers there. 72 for Brent crude. West Texas is at what? 67? I mean, it's really, really falling. Yeah, 67. All right, we move to Asian markets. Asia and Europe have been falling because of, I guess, the fear of uh, Trump tariff is the beginning of wisdom. The Asian markets, you can see there on your screen, they have been falling. They are bearish because in particular, the Nikkei 225, the Japanese index, is an export-oriented index. That is, most companies that are listed on that index, they export. You know Japan. You know all the companies that uh, Jap Japan uh, has produced. They export. They sell to the world from vehicles to electronics. Let's move to Europe. I hope the gallery is keeping up with me. I hope I'm not talking too fast. Let's move to Europe. Europe, yesterday, if you look, this is from yesterday or European stocks. Now, I want us to talk about European competitiveness because Donald Trump has brought competitiveness back into focus. Companies and countries are asking themselves, are we as competitive as the US? Can we withstand these tariffs? Traders are saying no. If you look at the European index, uh, for yesterday's close, save for the FTSE 100 in the UK, everything else is bearish. Which brings me to a chart from Bloomberg comparing the Eurostock 600 versus the S&P 500. If you look to the far right of that bar chart, you will see that the European uh, index has underperformed the US index to the tune of about 24 percentage points. And that is as a result of the big rally we've seen in the US that has not been replicated in other countries. And we've seen Asia, we've seen Europe. So now let's talk about European competitiveness. We were talking, I had a guest on my show, uh, Ebo Ekubanjo. He is the founder of Bento Africa, a tech company. Now we were talking about Donald Trump wanting to shut down uh, the Department of Education. And Ebu was making the point that, okay, if, if, if the education is so terrible in the U.S., why, why does the U.S. have the best companies? And listen to what he says about Europe. Listen to this. Finally, if American education is so incredibly bad, why is it that the most innovative companies, the best companies, we're talking about the largest companies in the world, the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, the open AIs of the world. I mean, is Europe even in the AI race yet? I mean, I know China is. You heard that. Is Europe even in the AI race? I, heard I know China is. Let me take you to a quote from Matthew uh, Rechetta. Uh, he's, I think, with uh, Bayer. And he is the uh, head of equity strategy at Julius Bayer. Julius Bayer. Listen to what he, look at what he said about European equities, right? Let me read you that quote. He said, we expect higher risk premium, higher risk premium um, to persist in the tariff exposed um, segments until greater clarity emerges. We maintain our cautious stance towards European equities opting to remain on the sidelines for the time being. Let me also take you back to something we covered here, Mario Draghi, Super Mario. In a European competitive report, we covered this back in September when he gave, presented this report to the EU. Hopefully you have the cover of the report in front of you. But specifically, if we link back to the whole con talk, talk about European competitiveness and Ebun's comment just a moment ago, look at what Mario Draghi uh, said. Basically that in the last, um, the, no EU company with a market cap over 100 billion euros has been set up from scratch over the last 50 years, while all six U.S. companies with a valuation of over a trillion have been created in this period. So right now, the conversation is about, look, Europe needs to step up. Europe needs to, to be as competitive as possible because, you know, Donald Trump is about to eat their lunch. Now, to the U.S. now, inflation numbers, we, were, we previewed this on Monday that they will be coming out Wednesday. They ticked up slightly to 2.6%. Now, in the United States, this is headline inflation in line uh, with forecast. It was 2.4% uh, in September. Now, there's another dynamic to this. Again, look, Trump is just giving everybody so much content. And us, as a business journalist, you're loving it. Analysts are now saying that the U.S. dollar is going to get stronger 
into 2025. What does that mean for us in emerging markets that have US dollar debt and everybody else? So this is uh, an analyst from Rabobank, a foreign exchange um, strategist, uh, Jane Foley. She said, it is, and hopefully you have the quote in front of you, it is our view that broad-based US dollar strength will last into 2025. The Fed's interest rate uh, cuts will come to a halt earlier and a, at a higher level due to Trump's policies. And speaking of the Fed, uh, Jerome Powell is going to be giving a U.S. economic outlook later today, I think about 3 p.m. Eastern time, which should be about you know, 8, 9 p.m. Uh, our time here. Now, look, in the past, when during the Biden administration, nobody, Powell was a boring person. You just ask about interest rates and you move on. But with Trump coming back into office again, now he's had to field questions about whether or not he will still remain in his job. Let me take you back to last week. Thursday, when uh, they cut interest rates by 25 basis points. Look at this question from a journalist asking him, will you be fired or will you be demoted? And Powell saying, no, it's not allowed under the law. Uh, I guess the other, the other question is, uh, to follow up on Victoria's question, um, do you believe the president has the power to fire or demote you and has the Fed determined the legality of a president demoting at will any of the other governors with leadership positions? Not permitted under the law. Not what? not permitted under the law. Thank you. So you can expect that Jerome Powell will likely field more questions about his job. Remember, just to remind people, Donald Trump says that the president of the United States should have a say in interest rate policy. So he should be determining where interest rates go. So everybody's looking forward to Powell's comments later today. Let's quickly get, to, I'm going to get to Bitcoin. Let's get to Nigeria very quickly. The Minister of Power, uh, Adil Abu, has said that Nigeria needs $10 billion, $10 billion, with a B, um, when, uh, with, in order to get 24-7 uh, uh, power. Uh, he got a, a visit from the head of the Infrastructure Construct, uh, Construction uh, Commission, IR, ICRC. Uh, let's take a look at the quotes that he said, uh, that the Minister of Power for Nigeria said, Mr. Adelabu. He said, uh, government cannot do it alone. This is why we have to look for organized private sector funding uh, while still retaining government interest and ownership. That is where the ICRC comes in. We need to do this in collaboration with the private sector and the best way is through concession um, you know look for the minister I, I guess we remember yesterday uh, we were talking about there was that what's trending and Vimbai shout out to you for doing a fantastic job on what's trending yesterday we we're talking about the blackouts in uh, Ibadan and uh, Rufai was talking about mining and I was we uh, Vimbai was talking about electricity and we both uh, we all came to the, to the conclusion that ministers have to step up ministers need to start talking about how much money they're bringing in don't tell us how much we need tell us how much you are securing to come and, and, and fix the uh, sector finally Bitcoin I have to talk about it because this is where we're going to round off. Um, Bitcoin, <laughs> it, it broke, it hit $92,000 at the end of the global business report yesterday around 5 p.m. West African time. Then it went to $93,000 uh, uh, and then fell back down um, to 89. So there should be a chart on your screen, a, a Bitcoin chart. It's just a wild volatility. The red arrow that you have there is the peak in the last, what, 12 hours where it hit 93,000. The blue arrow, within a matter of hours, it falls down to 88,000. Now it's about 89. Bitcoin, everything. Trump is just, everything skyrocketing and volatile. That's our update. Couple of things, Rotu. So for those that are holding Bitcoin, the truth has to be said, please. Look at the market properly and know where to make a mark and be sell. Because once the government pretty much starts after the 20th of January, all of this madness will stop. As regards Europe, Europe has constantly been the sick man, you know, all this while. In fact, if you read uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron's book before he emerged, uh, pres before he became president, the ideas he was espousing there was how he wanted France to leapfrog and do well economically. One of his major arguments in that book was that when you check the Cacaron, the CAC 40, most of the companies there are over 100 years old. Some of them are close to 100 years old. The likes of the Hermes of this world, the LVMH of this world, the Dussault systems over 50 years. And I even have a very interesting start for you. The entire market cap of the CAC 40, the CAC 40, is 2.3 trillion. That's just the market cap of one company, Alphabet, in America. 
the entire market cap of the entire stock market in France is that of just Alphabet that started less than 20 years, about 20 years, a little over 20 years ago. Let me use that word. So that's to show you that there's, they've had no, not much innovation. And that's why France, I know of France particularly, because I did some work with Business France. That's why they started Business France to be able to attract startups, to come and start up in France and all of that. They've made some successes, but you've not had that overarching success level. As regards the man that says he needs 10 billion to be able to fix the electricity problems in Nigeria, the minister that I was talking about, he should raise the money. He's a banker. He worked in the CBN at some point. He should be able to raise the money. That's where he comes in. He should be able to sell the electricity sector in such a way that's very juicy with all of the players in the sector to be able to raise the money. People like Femi Otodola are blazing the drill, raising capital with Giregu and what they've been able to do. We talked about Ilumelu yesterday, blazing the trail. We should be able to raise this money. This 10 billion is talking about, as regards transmission chain and everything chain, it should be private capital. This is money that some boys less than 20 years old will raise in less than 30 minutes in some parts of America. He should look at how to raise the money. He should not tell us. He should raise the money. See, they said they've deregulated and liberalized the electricity sector. He should raise the money. We are waiting for him. In the spirit of raising the money, I also want to hone in on the power sector because, you know, these comments came just uh, the following day after the EFCC boss, Olu Oluke Okoyede, had spoken about it, how the situation within the power sector brings him to tears. Or he says that if we knew the true depth of corruption within the power sector, we would shed tears. And he was talking about just, you know, the usual internal corruption that we see, you know, contract fraud. Uh, you know, guys will be contracted to go and buy a gauge for a 9.0 gauge, and they'll rather buy a 5.0 gauge. Uh, you know, the, the wrong material, inferior material is being used. And and so forth. So as much as I appreciate uh, that he, the, the Minister of Power has now made this valuation and said, well, this is what we need, uh, it, it's almost a similar conversation to the one we're having about NMPC, where we're saying, well, just removing subsidy doesn't mean that you're suddenly a highly efficient, transparent organization. So yes, there is the monetary aspect, but then there's the cultural aspect within your, within your organization, within your value chain. You know, where are you delivering value with the little that you have? Uh, just yesterday, I believe, TCN uh, shared another update about uh, another uh, e occurrence of yeah. vandalism. vandalism uh, yeah. uh, so, you know, where we're not seeing you lobbying for increased security around uh, power infrastructure, as this is infrastructure that is vital to national security. So we're not seeing the low-hanging fruits. We're not seeing you talk about, oh, let's bring in tech, let's bring in drones uh, to monitor our power lines and so forth. So I don't think many people are really going to appreciate the fact that, oh, suddenly there's an investment of $10 billion that's needed because there's a lot of non-monetary changes, cultural changes that can be made that will translate into significant changes in the power value chain here in Nigeria. Okay, uh, basic uh, issues that I think we should address. Yesterday, we had uh, the headline inflation data for the United States, which came in at 2.6% higher than, well, as economists expected, but higher than the projection of 2.2% 2, 2, uh, 2 that the Federal Reserve had been looking at. So uh, at the same time, coin inflation went up to about 3.3%. Uh, it has steady. That's a headline, uh, 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 that's a core inflation. Now, so, we look at uh, the markets in the United States, they look lo like they are range bound, but what has been the effect? You've seen a downward trend in the stock market, 0.11%, uh, for example, with the Dow Jones uh, Industrial Average, 0.02% with X&P uh, 500. But what does this mean in real time? So what it means that the dot plot that the uh, Federal Reserve gave us in September, you know, may not be what we should expect. That dot plot says that there will be a sharp cut again in December. But after that cut in December, would they continue uh, to cut rates? I don't think so. Because of the uh, political atmosphere, 
uh, Biden is leaving. Uh, Donald Trump is coming in. And Donald Trump, uh, you know, the projection is that there will be high inflation. So the expectation is that there's likely to be a slowing or a halt, you know, in that uh, dot plot that we were given in September by uh, 2025. Uh, so that's a big story from the uh, United States. Now, on the other hand, cryptocurrency is doing well, as you said. I mean, between Monday and today, Thursday is now in the $90,000 uh, range. Well, all of that is due to uh, Donald Trump. They believe that Donald Trump is more business friendly and all of that. But why uh, um, Bitcoin? Cryptocurrency is doing well. Gold is going down. Silver is going down. So you have at the other end of the spectrum, you know, gold and uh, Mr. Silver losing their value. All of this, again, is tied to uh, geopolitics. And then very quickly in England, we have this situation whereby there's an issue with car finance insurance, car finance insurance which is uh, threatening to become a very big uh, scandal and could have implications for the banks in, uh, in Britain. So this, for me, are the uh, major issues of the day. So those domestic issues in Nigeria. Look, we we'll just keep rotating at the same point forever. <laughs> but I hope there will be improve improvement. Thank you very much. Good.